life. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Practo Connect webinar. This is our uh, 25th edition of the Practo Connect webinar and we are doing this in, th we are doing this in three parts. Uh, this webinar, one second, I'll just turn my volume off. Uh, so uh, this webinar is on uh, emerging technologies in cardiology. Uh, we already had the first part uh, two weeks ago where we discussed uh, the changes in, uh, um, uh, in therapeutics of atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases. We discussed lipidology, diabetes mellitus, and obesity. And this part two is going to be on interventional cardiology. So to take the second part of this series, which is being held uh, with Plakto and uh, Dr. Anil Dhal, uh, we, we, have the, we have our distinguished speaker, Colonel Dr. Anil Dhal, Sena Medal with us. Welcome, Dr. Dhal, sir. Thank you, Nilesh. Uh, pleasure to be here. And, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, greetings for Independence Day for the, for the 75th year to all those who are attending. Right, sir. Thank you. And, greetings and, for, and for congratulations myself. to you for the silver anniversary of your practical. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you for being a part of, of our silver anniversary, sir. My pleasure. Right. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Anil Dal, sir, is a distinguished cardiologist practicing in Delhi for uh, quite a few years now. Right now, practicing in Gurgaon, he was earlier with the armed forces and uh, has been uh, uh, given the Sena Medal for his distinguished services to the armed forces. Uh, currently, he, uh, he practices in, in uh, Gurgaon, as I said, and he's been earlier with many top hospitals uh, around Delhi like Max and Artemis. Uh, today, Dr. Dadhal sir will be talking to us about international cardiology. And Dr. Dadhal sir, please, could you just recap what we talked about last time? And All right. So, so with your permission, I will share. Uh, can I share my screen? Please, sir. Please go ahead. All right. So, uh, welcome everybody. For those who are who do not uh, wish to have uh, a long weekend and uh, are committed to to Nilesh. Uh, uh, um, and 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 to uh, joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, because most people, I believe, are out on a long weekend. So this is the second part in a series. The, the amount of parts of the series will, is dependent on you and Nilesh. Uh, we are basically discussing the game changers in cardiovascular practice. Last time, we focused on giving this outline and also on uh, lipidology, because the the marvelous changes which have helped us uh, understand and control uh, cholesterol management or lipid management in our patients has come a long way. Diabetes is, is exploded with new drugs. The paradigm is completely and totally shifted from uh, secretagogues and insulin to modern therapies with SGLT2 inhibition and GLP-1 receptor analogs. Hypertension management, well, the drugs have become much easier, and uh, we also have some data which is coming in for it's especially difficult to treat hypertension. We may have uh, technological options. But more than that, I think what, what uh, technology is going to do to hypertension is it's going to make sure that we make people realize that one in three urban Indians especially uh, are hypertensive and they deserve to be treated to prevent short, medium, and long-term consequences. Well, this edition largely should focus on interventional cardiology, and I hope to get there. And this is going to be largely introspective. We are going to highlight some of the advances which have happened in this field, uh, highlights in, in our understanding of uh, um, coronary interventions, our understanding of, of how we can uh, understand the physiology of the coronaries better, how we can understand the, uh, the anatomy, how we can understand the, the images and the metabolism, and whether we should intervene, whether we should not intervene, uh, how does surgical intervention fare today, and uh, with the role shifting to minimum access, we also have a complete revolution in the structural era. See, uh, we started by doing transcatheter aortic valve replacements, which were, which were largely in high risk or um, inordinately high, high surgical risk patients. But today we have reasonable data for intermediate as well as low risk patients 
Uh, we are also moving from there to, to innovative mitral valve therapies, to tricuspid therapies. Uh, pulmonary valve therapies have always been there. So, Plus, so, left atrial appendage occlusion. So, if, if I may interrupt. So, uh, uh, are you sharing your screen? Because I can't see. I, I am. Can't. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really sorry, sir. I, I can't see it. Yeah, shall I do it again? Please, sir. Please. Right, sir. I can see the screen now. Could you just present it? All right. Can you see it now? I can see the screen, but I want you to present it. it it's, it's like in the uh, grid view. It's, it's in the... Yeah, yeah. So I'm starting slideshow. Right, sir. Yeah. Can you yeah, see it now? Yes, yeah. sir. Please go. So, so then there have been remarkable advances in and game-changing advances in electrophysiology from two-dimensional uh, uh, understanding of electrophysiology we move to Cato mapping, uh, to, to, to NAVX and understanding the three-dimensional uh, um, uh, electrophysiology movements, as, especially in terms of offering radiofrequency ablation in focused therapy. Uh, in addition, we could, we could also move further and do more physiological pacing uh, with the advent, not only of cardiac resynchronization therapy in those who had a left bundle branch block and um, um, dilated cardiomyopathy, but also in those, uh, we, we can now offer his bundle pacing and left bundle pacing. We can also occlude the left atrial appendage for those who are uh, at, uh, with atrial fibrillation and high risk for embolization, but unable to take anticoagulation. Heart failure has, is, a, is a field which has, which has really exploded with the foundational four treatments of heart failure, which include uh, SGLT2 inhibition, um, uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, beta blockers, and ARNI. So this has been the foundational four, and, and knocking on the door are, are new drugs like Verisiguat and uh, Omicamptiv, which will actually increase the armamentarium beyond uh, what we ever knew. Uh, digoxin or digitoxin may be making a small comeback in select cases. It's a matter of being evaluated. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if we move to the devices from the devices which we which we already had, like I discussed about uh, CRT, uh, we also today have LVADs. We also have devices for acute heart failure. We have very good LV support devices. In fact, just yesterday, the Restore HF was published, which is a brilliant device, a brilliant uh, study, which actually shows that high risk intervention performed under Impella actually helped improve ejection fraction in people who had poor ejection fraction. Although the transplant numbers have been far from, uh, shall I say, rewarding, uh, they are rewarding in individual cases, but the number of patients who deserve them are unable to get it. Uh, we have, this year was a landmark event with a xenotransplantation with gene editing using CRISPR technology. And David Bennett, the patient, uh, did survive about 67 days. COVID was a game changer in our understanding a lot about cardiology because of it. Uh, firstly, the, uh, the, um, the COVID, uh, 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 the coronavirus attached itself to the ACE2 receptor. And so we had issues regarding whether ACE inhibitors uh, or ARBs would be useful or not. Or, and thereafter, we realized that there were a lot of people who not only had a myocardial involvement, but also a lot of venous and arterial thrombosis and uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, among other arrhythmias. COVID also led to a lot of webinars, and it also led to a lot of improvement in, in telemedicine. And, and the post-COVID telecardiology has now become something which can be used in our day-to-day -day practice. There were some issues regarding big data, and we all know about the Sergisphere controversy, but Artificial intelligence, well, let's first start with human intelligence, but artificial intelligence itself may help us in at least dealing with populations, if not with individuals. And we are training ourselves better with virtual rea reality and augmented reality. So for a quick uh, recap on lipidology, I'm not going to take you through the landmark trials, uh, the, the pre-statin era, the statin era, and now we have come to the post-statin era, wherein we know that uh, we have been dropping our guideline recommended LDL goals, and there is a because there is a relationship between L, achieved LDL and uh, change percentage 
a troma volume on, on IVUS. And, and we actually know that unless and until we bring the LDL below 65, we are, we are going to continue to have progression. Now, this is, uh, we, we also know that both genetically and pharmacologically mediated a lower LDL uh, leads to lower risk of CHD and, and combining lifestyle modification, uh, diet itself is responsible only for one fourth to one third of our cholesterol, statins, which have been the bedrock, uh, um, ezetimibe, um, uh, uh, we, have, we have bempedoic acid, which is now available, PCSK9 inhibition, and especially the, the current data, which we had from the last ACC of the Pac-Man AMI, showing its role also in acute coronary syndrome. We are also looking at uh, um, combinations of statins and ezetimibe, combinations of epitoic acid and ezetimibe. And, and for high tri triglycerides, we have uh, icosapent ethyl, which is actually the purified um, I EPA, which is the part of the omega-3 because the DHA was not good. So all this is, there are many other drugs which are, which are knocking on the doors. We may have an answer to elevated lipoprotein little a, and we are also looking at APOC3 and, and angiopoietin 3. Uh, of course, in familial hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia, homozygous, we can also think of uh, lipoprotein apheresis. But despite all this, we all know that there is a residual risk which remains, and uh, they, this could be inflammatory, this could be thrombotic, this could be just triglycerides, lipoprotein little a, or it could be, it could be just level of, of diabetic control. So Professor Eugene Brunwald said, if you want to live to be 100 before developing clinical atherosclerosis, have your uh, an ACVD threshold of seven LDLC gram years. So lower the LDL for longer is the way to go. And how do we achieve it? Well, this is about technology and the CRISPR-Cas9 actually has some great answers. We all know that uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and, and Jennifer Dutna in 2020, won the Nobel Prize for chemistry for discovering the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And this has been used by a recent company called Verve to actually, they've done the first in man, a 40 patient study, which is being done in New Zealand, whereby uh, CRISPR uh, using technology called Verve 101, which with one injection will be able to decrease the LDL cholesterol by 70% for a lifetime. So wherein we were looking at PCSK9 inhibition with either the uh, either using just PCSK9 inhibitors like evolucumab, uh, which is to be given twice a month, or we were very excited uh, because, because intlisiran, which is acts by small interfering RNA, would be given twice in a year. But we may well have technology which will be one in a lifetime gene editing to actually take this away. So all this... Uh, we, we need to, again, for inflammation, we do have choices. Uh, we have had some confusing data regarding colchicine in appropriate subsets. Yes, uh, canacunumab probably is too expensive a technology. But what about diabetes? Diabetes uh, concerns almost every family. Every eight seconds, somebody dies, and maybe about over 500 million by 2030. And it is actually uh, responsible for almost 40 to 50% of deaths the world over. Plus, what we have is diabetes. You know, we've, we've moved, uh, we, we, we have the obese diabetics, and although in India, we do have what is called the thin fat phenotype, so that although uh, visually the person may not be looking obese, but his metabolism is like an obese diabetic. And we all know that there can be microvascular or macrovascular problems, uh, and, and uh, we, we have to prevent uh, uh, these problems because diabetes is indeed a vascular disease. And there is a central role in both cardiovascular and renal disease because it can affect the pumps, the pipes, and the filters, causing heart failure, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and renal disease. And heart failure is actually the second most common initial cardiovascular event in patients with diabetes. So what do we want to achieve? We want an HbA1c around 7, no weight gain. No hypoglycemia because 70% of risk reduction for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease happens by non glycemic factors. The Steno2, which now has over 15 years follow up, actually shows us that good lipid management, good blood pressure management, better lifestyle is going to be 
responsible for better care. Yes, we have problems as cardiologists in P when we perform PCI in diabetics because there is a higher rate of post-PCI death, MI, and, and uh, revascularization because there is a higher atherosclerotic burden, diffuse disease, and lesions may actually be, be because of negative remodeling, uh, which is a potential risk of perforation if we do a very aggressive stent sizing. And there is, you have to think of a pro, a diabetes as a prothrombotic state with antiplatelet resistance. So if you want to prevent atherogenesis, possibly the data coming from all the trials looking at GLP-1 receptor analogs. And today we not only have a game changer, but actually a life changer because uh, using SNAC in combination with semaglutide, which has a 94% homology uh, with, the, with the natural GLP-1 uh, uh, receptor, we, we, we actually, with the natural encrypting, we actually have uh, oral semaglutide, which is available, which can decrease atherothrombosis and avoid hypoglycemia. But those who are at heart failure risk, well, today, SGLT2 inhibition has become standard of care. Well, blood pressure is a common problem known to us since times immemorial. There have been many filmy analogies because people think that they get headaches because of high blood pressure. It is largely, largely a silent killer. 25% of rural India, 30% of urban India has hypertension. And, and re, if we just decrease our salt or sodium intake, and we are all chatoras who love to have our snacks and we love to uh, get uh, chart, et cetera. So, so we, we can need to decrease our salt intake to say we will actually be able to save a lot of lives. So this, the, if we just briefly overview the history of blood pressure research in the century, we find that before 1900, a high blood pressure was thought to be a normal process of aging. It was, it was FDR. In fact, the three people who were at the Yalta conference, on the next slide will probably show that, uh, were, 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 were Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. And all three were hypertensives. And only when Roosevelt died from a stroke with a blood pressure of 300 by 190, uh, well, then, then NIH and everybody got involved in hypertension research and we started having more, more data, which has emerged, which emerged over a period of time. The VA study, then there, there were associations with death, the Framingham study, and so on. And these were the, the famous Yalta conference, and all three were hypertensive. But what has been the advantage, or what have been the game-changing technology which has emerged? Firstly, the drugs have become much easier. When I uh, graduated, the drugs that we used to use for hypertension from an asymptomatic disease used to make a symptomatic patient, and many people used to avoid it. The current drugs are much, much more user-friendly, and, and, and they do not even, we can even curb their metabolic side effects. But for those who, who have difficult to treat hypertension, well, there are options, and we can now have, we have data uh, from renal denervation. Uh, there was some issue with, with the first Simplicity 3 study, which was a sham controlled clinical trial, but, but over a period of time, we are getting more and more data uh, from the Global Simplicity Registry about the benefits. So combining diet, exercise, salt reduction, weight management, combination drug therapy, and renal denervation, we probably are going to get better. Obesity. Now, obesity, uh, just, we don't need to tell people. We have been fat shamed. I have been fat shamed since I was in school. And, and uh, this fat shaming was largely physical. Nobody realized that this obesity was also going to have hemodynamic stresses, neurohumoral stresses, metabolic stresses, a sympathetic overflow, oxidative stresses, inflammatory condition, uh, apoptosis, and defective autophagy, which could affect the kidney, the heart, the blood vessel, the liver, um, and, and the bone. And, and uh, this is, is really a systemic disease because it leads, it comes from adipose tissue dysfunction, uh, which is an inability to store excess calories, which leads to uh, release of in, inflammatory uh, processes, adipokine, cellular hypoxia, and there are at least 140 genetic regions which are now known to influence uh, these obesity traits. And there are also neuropathological associations with the mesolimbic, the hypothalamic, and the frontal lobe are primarily evolved to protect against weight loss. And this brings us not just to a heart 
and and uh, and uh, uh, liver connection, but there is indeed a gut and and brain connection, which also is very important because there are hormones such as GLP one, uh, which we already discussed. Uh, 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 leptin, ghrelin, and other nutrient regulated hormones which impact the brain and weight regulation. And how much of weight loss is required to, uh, to improve obesity related symptoms? Well, uh, if you want to prevent diabetes, just a 3 to 10% would be good. But if you want to remit diabetes, you might need 10 to 15%. So, uh, really, you need, to, you need to look at that. And the great thing is that a few years ago, we did not have any options. But today, not just early stat or, or whatever options we had would lead to, to valvular abnormalities. The Penfen syndrome is something which we know, but the advent of GLP-1 receptor analogs and um, the movement thereafter to metroleptin, to cell melanotide, and, and now even to a uh, combination of naltrexone, bupropion, use a semaglutide, use appropriately of, uh, uh, of bariatric surgery and newer drugs, which are actually uh, mind-blowing in their results because the tirzepatide, uh, which is a dual agonist uh, in the surmount one, 85% uh, of trial participants lost at least 5% body weight at all doses and more than half lost 20% of body weight at 10 milligram and 15 milligram doses, uh, which is a triple agonist. Cagrilantide will again lead to such great uh, benefits. So whether it is GLP-1 receptor analogs, whether it is dual analogs or triple analogs, watch this space. This is something which is going to be very exciting in our time. This is emerging technology. But if we come back, what does the AHA tell us? So from Life Simple 7, they made Life Sim Essential 8. And I have purposely included this slide, not for anything else, but to concentrate on the psychological health, which they have said that when an individual deals with interpersonal relationships, institutional, organizational relationships, uh, jobs are much more difficult, living in society is much more difficult, you need better structures and systems, so you need to be able to handle anxiety, anger, hostility, stresses, pessimism, depression, and convert it into mindfulness, gratitude, optimism, and a sense of purpose. So, I think this is a part which we will hear more and more about improving psychological health in times to come. So uh, from here, we, we actually make a jump to the topic of today, which is interventional cardiology. And I would be, if there are still any questions or which uh, need to be answered for, for preventive cardiology or clinical cardiology, I would love to take them at any time. So going back to a cartoon which I showed previously, Reverend Stephen Hales in the 1700s, measure the blood pressure invasively. This is probably the first time that somebody's blood pressure was measured. And, and of course, uh, uh, Ronjan discovered the properties of the X-ray and that's his wife's ring finger. Uh, and of course, it was, uh, it was Forsman who was trying to take uh, his nurse Didson out for dinner and said, I will, I will reach the heart. He was actually trying to reach her heart. But finally, he put a... Uh, um, a radio opaque red rubber catheter. He was a urology resident a, into the right atrium on his own self. And this is probably the first catheterization, although unknown to him, Otto Klein had probably done this a few weeks before this. But nevertheless, like I mentioned last time, Didzen ag agreed to go out for dinner with him. He won the Nobel Prize 24 years later, and he, uh, he was dismissed from urology. So uh, just to mm, mm, I recap what Vossman said about himself, he said he must be the least intelligent person to ever win the Nobel Prize. And Mason Soans, who by accident, uh, uh, while performing an aortogram, had a catheter which flipped into the right coronary artery and highlighted the right coronary artery. And uh, he ran around trying to, uh, uh, trying to actually cut open the, the chest so that he could do an AC def defibrillation, because those days there was no DC defibrillation, uh, till he realized that the patient had gone into asystole. And he said, cough, cough, cough. And in those few seconds, the patient coughed and the right coronary angiogram was recorded. This led a great cardiac surgeon by the name of Ake Seni to actually fund the, the research of this great man, uh, um, who, uh, Andreas Grunzig, who laid the foundation of interventional cardiology by starting what is called angioplasty today. Of course, uh, um, the, the grounds for this were laid by, by Charles' daughter, 
and uh, Judkins, who even 15 years before his time had performed a mechanical uh, kind of uh, daughter phenomena in, in a psychiatrical atherosclerotic iliac artery, but, but for the coronaries, it was largely Andreas Grunzig. And this led to evolution of angioplasty. Uh, if, you just, if you just see what happened, Andreas Grunzig uh, unfortunately um, succumbed uh, during while flying a solo plane in, 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 in a storm uh, in 1985, but, but in just eight years, he had created history. The first patient was a 38-year-old mechanical engineer by the name of Dolph Backman, who had a proximal LED. And you can see here the proximal LED stenosis. And, and Bernie Meyer, who was his resident, was nominated or elected or told, go and get a, uh, go and get a consent. And, and, and Backman said, yes, why not? And, and this was dilated. And if you see, this is the transtenotic gradient during that, that first dilatation. And apparently, when H. Senning was in the cat lab, when this was being done, and when he saw that the pressure which was actually came up, he went out saying, this is going to work. This is going to be the treatment of the future. And he himself was a leading cardiac surgeon. So such is the Bonhomme. Uh, so interventional cardiology owes its presence today to great urology residents uh, like, like Postman, uh, great concepts from the urology, which are which were taken by, by, um, by daughter and, and then uh, by a cardiac surgeon who funded Grunzig's research. But we have come a long way and I'm going to just cut to the chase because uh, revascularization itself, whether it was surgical or it was by virtue of angioplasty, went through various phases. And if we really look at some of the phases in 1980s, we had we had uh, the phase where only the CAS and the VA CAS studies were there. Uh, there was a rule of two or three, uh, uh, you know, severe triple vessel disease or at least two vessel disease involving left main or proximal LED with, uh, with the reduction of left ventricular ejection fraction. So basically severe disease patients with, with diseased hearts were taken and they were surgically revascularized because initially, where what Grunwald uh, or what uh, Grunzig had thought was that he would do a single vessel proximal discrete non calcified disease. But as the technology improved, as the technology evolved, we moved further to going beyond a single vessel to two or three vessels. And then there was a lot of introspection. You could say that there were, there were a little bit of tough issues between the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon for the same patient. Uh, but our understanding also improved significantly. And in 2020s, we need, to, we need to be more scientific. We need to calculate appropriate anatomical scores, understanding the ischemia. We today understand the physiology better. Today, we understand the architecture of the vessels better. We can image inside arteries by using either light or sound. If we use, if we are either using intravascular ultrasound, which is using sound, or optical coherence tomography, which is using light. And then we can also understand some microcirculatory issues because only 5% of, uh, of the coronary tree is epicardial. Then we also had some very, very counterintuitive studies which got published. The stitch and stitches trial, which actually showed that if you have reasonable epicardial targets, if you have LV dysfunction, you are going to benefit your patient by revascularization. Now, initially, this is all done with surgical revascularization, but I guess the same thing extends. And with the Restore AF being published just two days ago, in patients in whom surgery is at prohibitively high risk, we can possibly get away with a good or well-conducted angioplasty, despite the risk, because the risk can be mitigated to some extent by doing LV support using newer devices like the impeller. There was some issue regarding moderate ischemia, and this issue I will discuss in greater detail, uh, which is created by initially by the Courage trial about the value of optimal medical therapy, William Bowden's trial. And then we had the very famous ischemia study, because for till from 77 till recently, we used to think we, we cardiologists had an oculostentic reflex. Our job was to find and fix coronary occlusions, but today, Optimal medical therapy, just like we have discussed in the prelude to interventional cardiology, has much better antiplatelets. We have much better disease-modifying agents. 
We can control high blood pressure. We have high potency statins, ezetimibe. We can use PCSK9 inhibition, inclisiran. We can use icosapentithi for diabetics. We know pipes, pumps, and filters benefit with SGLT2 inhibitors. We know that there is regression of atherosclerosis with GLP-1 receptor analogs. Even anti-ischemic therapy, we are, we are good with beta blockers. Uh, Anti-inflammatory therapy, your colchicine is making its way at least where we suspect that there is a large inflammatory component. Our diets, we are understanding our diets a little better. We are understanding cardiac rehab and exercise. Of course, we have to tell people to stop using tobacco in any form. And this is a major problem in India because this is one problem which kills at both ends. We achieve better blood pressure and glycemic control, and we can also achieve weight loss. So if you look at all the scientific revolutions, they undergo what is called a Kuhn cycle. And uh, Thomas Kuhn progressed, uh, showed the progress in science, which happens through revolutions. He felt that there was a pre-scientific background, which led to normal science. But there's new data which comes, which leads to a model drift. There's a model crisis, a model revolution. Finally, there's a paradigm shift. And for example, when we had the Copernican revolution was the paradigm shift from the Ptolemaic uh, model of the heavens, which described the cosmos as having the earth stationary to the heliocentric model with the sun at the center of the, of the solar system. So we are understanding all this more and more every day. And we had this very famous cartoon from Rory Hakama, which is data, which actually looked at about an 11% ischemia, which is where in the risk of revascularization, the benefit of revascularization far exceeded the risk of revascularization. But this was also used in the, uh, and, and therefore it led to a lot of changes in the concept of coronary artery disease treatment. In 1980s, we only looked at coronary artery stenosis as a focus of detection and treatment. Then we moved to ischemia. Then we realized that there could be something called a vulnerable plaque. Then we realized that more than a vulnerable plaque, you need to you understand which is the vulnerable patient. So from a, a lesion focus, we move to a patient-centric approach. Likewise, in revascularization, from a vulnerable plaque, we also realize that inflammation, plaque activation, a very hot, angry plaque will lead to worse results in the long, medium, and short term. Uh, they, then we understood that we need to use more physiology and imaging. Imaging to size the vessel, physiology to choose whether to do it. And we, we recently had data even from the defined PCI, which actually showed that up to 24% of PCIs, uh, if you did a P, uh, FFR following the PCI, were probably required some improvement. So we are moving from revascularization to early detection prevention. We are looking at prothrombotic milieu, atheroma burden, disease activity as the actual triangle of ACS risk. And so if I were to put it in one slide, uh, this was from a recent review, I think, or uh, uh, in, in European Heart Journal. So for acute coronary syndrome, there is just no doubt. Go right ahead and fix it. PCI is probably the answer. If you don't have PCI pharmacological therapy, the more myocardial salvage in the first four hours that you can achieve, the better it is. But what happens to uh, chronic uh, or what we call chronic coronary syndromes or stable effort angina, then we need to understand the coronary profile, the location of the, of the stenosis, whether it is in the left main, it is in the proximal LED or proximal coronaries, what is the amount of, of myocardium which is being subtended, what is the ejection fraction now? So it can lead either to intensification of guideline-directed medical treatment for cardiovascular prevention, anti-anginal, or we can, we can go ahead and try and find out whether we need to do an invasive angiography with FFR, IFR, or a variety of different stress tests so that we can optimize these patients. So in the modern era, the earlier days, we had only devices and we were only proceduralists. But today, in the modern era, we have therapies because we are back to being doctors. We are back to being clinicians. And the incorrect hypothesis was that if we removed coronary plaque, it reduces restenosis. For example, we thought that thromboaspiration will always improve outcomes after primary angioplasty. But we know that whereas coronary stents do work, they, they are a simple solution, which, which actually uh, decreases 
uh, the, the abrupt closure, it decreases the recoil, it can tackle the recoil and does decrease the restenosis, but it led to a stent frenzy and finally led to our understanding that stents itself can cause neoantimal hyperplasia. So we had drug doted stents. We started with Sirolimus. Uh, the, the first study was Zephyr because we thought we had a free approach zero. Uh, and then Paclitaxel, but but then this was probably the first patient who had who had Eduardo Zuza had done uh, uh, a proximal LED lesion, but but and this has been followed up to ten years and is looking very good. But there were problems, and the problems were that there was because of the drugs there were delayed healing. There was there was uh, late stent thrombosis, incomplete apposition, abnormal vasomotion. So so we moved from there. We moved. We move to more, to better clinical evidence. We move to second generation, third generation uh, um, uh, drug eluting stents. We actually brought in a bioabsorbable vascular scaffold, but because it was 158 micron strut thickness, it could not stand the test of, of actually practice and, and was withdrawn. Maybe it'll get reintroduced. We now have 100 micron strut thickness indigenous uh, um, uh, bioabsorbable vascular scaffold, which is available. But we do not know how times will, will move. But what we are doing is we are doing more imaging and using more physiology. Why imaging? Let us just understand. One of the first importance in treating when we are expanding the armamentarium of care, we need to identify which lesion will not open with just a balloon. And therefore, we need to identify calcium because calcium can impair stent delivery, decrease stent expansion, increase malapposition, and stent asymmetry. So if you are looking at, at this, I'm sorry, I think I'm moving backwards. Sorry. Yeah. So we, we know that uh, uh, when we are doing heavily calcific lesion, we used to, a few years ago, not touch these patients. Then David Roth in 1984 introduced something called rotational atherectomy. And rotational atherectomy works by two simple, it was a diamond coated burr on, uh, which, which could be made to rotate at high speeds. And this, uh, what it did was that it, by two principles of physics, one was differential cutting. Every morning when we, when we shave our beard, we, we cut our hard beard, but we don't cut soft skin. Secondly, by orthogonal displacement of friction. When you spin it at high uh, speeds, it moves in, in, in a perpendicular direction. But we need to first identify whether the, the lesion is calcific because not all calcium is the same. Something can be deep, something can be superficial, something can be concentric, something can be eccentric, something can be exophytic. Now we understand that, that sound uh, does not see beyond calcium, whereas light, can see beyond calcium. And here you can actually find that what you are seeing here is actually a large calcium. It is a thick calcium. So for thickness, we, we need to use light. And, and uh, because IVUS does not penetrate, cannot measure thickness, it only measures arc and length. And, and uh, unlike IVUS, calcium penetrates and is able to measure the, the thickness. And now we can do a calcium volume index scoring, which, which can and, and uh, we understand that there are going to be limitations of simple balloon because high pressure balloon will preferentially expand away from the calcium, having limited effect on the calcium uh, and, and may cause dissections in other areas. So what do we have? We have uh, options. We have non-compliant balloon. We have scoring or cutting balloon. Uh, we have high pressure balloons. We have rotational atherectomy. We have orbital atherectomy and we have intravascular lithotripsy. So like I said, David Roth introduced this in 1984, but now we have a Rota Pro system. Uh, it is easier to learn and use, easier to set up. And uh, we also have the Diamondback, uh, which is an orbital atherectomy system. It actually has an eccentric diamond coated crown. And by, by eccentric motion, it actually sands the calcium. So uh, this is likely to be introduced in the country shortly. And, uh, uh, but there are some limitations. Uh, for example, it requires a dedicated wire, it is contact dependent. There is some thermal injury, more platelet activation. You cannot protect a side, uh, 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 so you cannot use a second guide wire. There will be some uh, distal embolization and it is technically challenging. So today we have a new device using the shockwave or the lithotripsy. So this, has, uh, this is an integrated balloon which has, which has lithotripters inside it. Which are which which can which can pulse once per second and up to eighty pulses per catheter. Uh, this is the generator outside. 
and it can actually uh, it is a high speed sonic pressure wave which uh, which which is created safely inside an integrated uh, balloon and and this is um, uh, you can see what it is doing up to about 50 atmospheres of pressure is with with one single pulse it is being able to uh, which is uh, uh, from the coupler it is delivered to the emitter which expands and collapses and this has been a game changer because this causes cracks like this to appear in the calcium allowing the stent to expand it and and there are multiple uh, cracks which you can see which have emerged here allowing much better results which are which are uh, some of these may be beyond the resolution of uh, of iverson oct and this allows us to have good short medium and long term results what is the flip side the cost it is also very easy to use it has a it has probably a much lesser learning curve than would have rotational etherectomy or even orbital etherectomy. What about laser? Well, we all know that in instant restenosis, maybe in thrombotic lesions, moderate calcification, failed balloon, osteo lesions, long lesions, we can actually use a laser. So this has led to, I'm not going to go into the nuances of it because laser fulgurates even the clots. And if you use it, Normally, we take away the heme, but if you if you are if you are actually doing a contrast-based laser, it can also create a larger break into whatever system you are using. So we we use imaging, and if you assess the type of calcium, you can individualize the treatment. You can choose whether you cannot cross with a with your IVL balloon, then you need a rotational etherectomy. Uh, once you have done that, then probably if you have broken the calcium enough. Then it is fine if you've got adequate space, prepared the bed adequately, it is fine. Otherwise, you may need to use uh, an IVL along with it and then achieve better results. But all this is because when we understand the physiology, so we are using more and more imaging and physiology. And if you look at these um, eight randomized controlled trials, we, we can actually see that they, the IVAS guided mace is much less than the angio guided mace. And, and the ultimate, again, showed us the same thing, because there are only two fundamental questions in interventional cardiology. Actually, the two fundamental questions are, why do we perform intervention? Number one, to improve quantity of life. Number two, to improve quality of life. Improving quantity of life. How do we assess for improvement of quantity of life? Normally, proximal lesions, left main lesions, proximal LED are responsible, or even proximal right, proximal large circumflex, dominant circumflex, will lead to improvement in quantity of life. What about quality of life? Now, if I'm going to come to quality of life, there should be inducible ischemia, which has been demonstrated adequately. But once we are on the table, should I treat and how should I treat? Everything else is really commentary. So if we are looking at just an angiogram, we have to understand that, that because these the, the plaques are sometimes not always concentric, and we may actually be misreading our angiogram. For example, we, we, if a pla plaque is tangential, there would be limitations of a coronary angiography and visual acumen may not always be accurate. So, and if you see this, if 200 stable patients, the R3F French study, uh, they were given to different cardiologists, 43% were reclassified. And if you actually did FFR uh, in these, 33% of so-called triple vessel disease were changed to medical treatment. So, for example, we have a variety of modalities, FFR, IFR, intravascular ultrasound, uh, we, OCT, and combinations. But the clinical questions are, is the lesion flow limiting? Is it in left main, non-left main? Can pre-intervention lesion assessment change my angioplasty plan? Reference vessel diameter, lesion length. What is the pathology? Is there a lot of calcium? Is there thrombus? How do I optimize result? And if my stent fails, why should it fail? So we must understand that FFR is a continuous variable. And, and this continuous variable, everybody used to initially be fixated on 0.8 or 0.75. But we must understand that this continuous variable is responsible for our understanding uh, different physiologies in different people. There can be pitfalls in re obtaining reliable physiology. We need to use vasodilatation. We need to normalize. It should be no touch. We should watch the setup, weigh the result, and wait for the right time. Because sometimes, and we have to use adenosine to create maximum hyperemia. 
but but if you do not want to use uh, adenosine cannot use uh, adenosine or or any other vasodilating substance for creating maximum hyperemia today we can use an instantaneous wave free ratio which is uh, when the resistance is naturally constant and minimized so this wave free period has been taken and studied by the defiant flare as well as the sweetheart which actually showed it was non inferior to to ffr and led to different companies uh, getting different indices of of uh, non hyperemic uh, pressure flows and this is uh, by using either ifr dpr rfr and this can be so if you look at ffr we go by 0.80 whereas in non hyperemic we normally take 0.89 and pd per pa which is the whole all systems is 0.91 and this has now been made to doing what is called precision pci because we can actually do a virtual pci virtual pci outside when we see uh, we can we can have co registration along with uh, doing this ifr and we can know where exactly the step ups have happened uh, so where exactly should the stents be placed how many stents are needed and what will be the result after the stent because like i told you defined pci showed us that one in four patients may lead with significant residual ischemia an ifr of less than 0.9 so if you have to put all this down we can combine it but of course it gives us a window of opportunity to to minimize the maze uh, which are actually mistakes using angiographic coronary evaluation and today we can do this by offsite computing even on a ct scan uh, whereas whereas it can actually serve as a gatekeeper and this are some examples of an ffr ct and today we can even use mathematical modeling to use it only on an geography based ffr and this is something which has been used with a with a qfr which is based only on it is less invasive physiological index uh, which can be done with or without uh, using any any other uh, technological tools uh, it just goes by the frame count and and with or without inducing hyperemia can help us so uh, this is really the the science of pci has been revitalized over a period of time because machine learning based ffr has 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 moved forward we are combining oct and ffr uh, to uh, improve the accuracy of high risk or patient assessment and can be embraced and we have variety of different algorithms which can be which can be taken into consideration now there have been some issues which have been which have some negative trials which have spurred the debate over ffr's role because some say it has a niche or uh, in light of smaller studies but as a means to defer not justify a stent because fame 3 failed to match the the cabg surgery for reduction of mace uh, at one year report 2 uh, showed that ffr during chest pain was not beneficial by and large ffr should be used for for chronic coronary syndrome not acute coronary syndrome because there i think imaging and understanding there is an ulceration or or a very active plaque is more important and the iris of ffr showed that uh, uh, revascularization less than 0.65 reduced the risk of cardiac death uh, was more stringent than 0.80 so we need to understand both physiology and plaque characteristics of vulnerability uh, because there is a pathophysiological interplay and these are complementary to decrease coronary events we need to understand both plaque pathology and coronary physiology in doing this we have great tools i discussed just a little while ago about uh, the uh, the uh, the restore ef uh, trial which was reported i think yesterday so the the uh, for cardiogenic shock of those patients who have, who present with cardiogenic shock um, we 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 did not have satisfactory classifications the sky offered a abcde kind of classification a pre shock classic a deteriorating or doom and extremis uh, because uh, if you consider uh, at risk is the match book uh, borderline is the lit match a classic is the waste basket fire blood pressure less than 90 uh, tissue malperfusion which is happening but we need to actually act fast because if the curtains of the house are on fire we may not we may not be able to change it of course a cardiac arrest uh as in the case of some of the celebrities that we hear about raju shivasthav right now is still on a ventilator neurological response is still to be seen so uh, patients are coming in with very variety of different types of of uh, uh, heart failure and cardiogenic shock they, they this can be either uvulimic 
This can be LV shock, or RV shock, or biventricular shock. And we have a variety of different devices which are now available to help us. Uh, we used to have only the balloon pump, but we, we realized that by the IBP shock too, that it is not largely effective. It is making some data come back. And for most of us, that is probably the only thing, but we understand that it increases cardiac output only by 0.5. Whereas greater devices like the Impella, which is like a Tulu water pump, which pumps the, the blood from the LV to the aorta can also be used. The Impella RP can be used for the right circulation. It can go from 2.5, 3.5, or even five surgically implanted impella can be up to five uh, uh, liters per minute increase in cardiac output. The tandem heart creating something from the left atrium to the femoral artery and using more ECMO, uh, which is, you know, during the, uh, the COVID pandemic, we used a lot of VV ECMO for patients who, are, uh, who, who had severe respiratory compromise. But using the VA ECMO, although it helps us uh, it helps the tissue perfusion, but does not really help the heart and can sometimes create a north south syndrome or what we call a Harlequin syndrome. Uh, it can be used. Uh, there are different forms of MCS, uh, like I said, balloon pump, ECMO, tandem heart, impella, and a variety of different combinations of this because the hemodynamic responses will be different. In the 70s, we had only balloon pump. Today, we have a whole lot of these devices which are available. We also have the Lund University device for, for spontaneous uh, you know, uh, a CPR, which can go ahead. It can cause uh, radiolucent uh, chest compression so that we can actually have these patients uh, on the table with ongoing cardiac massage. Uh, of course, we need to, these are large bore devices and we need to protect uh, the, uh, the, the limb circulation to prevent ischemia. But these are some of the uh, transportations which have happened. And, and uh, we all know in Paris, the bystander eCPR, uh, which is the using ECMO, is started actually uh, by, uh, by the police because they are the first bystanders. Uh, so, so this is something which we can all understand over a period of time. These are some of the different uh, impella, um, uh, uh, the pigtails which are used. This is like I said, it is like a Tulu water pump. ECMO may have its own, some of its own issues about brain perfusion, limb ischemia, need for transfusion, inflammatory response. And like I said, uh, if you just sim put it simply, IBP works in many of the patients. We need to be a little more aggressive. Uh, uh, ECMO and impella are viable alternatives and we need to have our own individual algorithms of care. There are some new devices which are coming up. Sunshine Heart, New Pulse, the Retarn Pump, which has been coming and going for the last 20 years, the Eotics device and Second Heart. So all this are something which will fit into the modern era of PCI, which will have better coronary, better vascular, and better structural, because modern era PCI will be percutaneous cardiovascular intervention. We can come now briefly to the structural revolution. Uh, we now have more than 20 years of Alain Cribier having done the first high-risk transcatheter aortic valve implant on the 16th of April, 2002. We, are, we have done more than 20 years today and, and he actually went transeptal and, and uh, placed a device in the aortic valve. But, but the structural revolution is really a disruptive technology. It has guideline changing therapies and it is a field in evolution. Uh, because nobody could have predicted such a rapid technological evolution, so much of procedural refinement, simplification, so much of avalanche of, of clinical evidence and acceptance of a heart team and dramatic, so that even surgeons are embracing it and a dramatic reduction in complications and improved clinical outcomes. So the partner clinical trial, uh, which is using the Sapien device, which is a balloon mounted device, over 10,000 patients, more than 200 manuscripts, uh, uh, the Evolute, uh, we, which is so we we today can move not just to a tower but transcatheter valve therapy. I discussed briefly pulmonary valve, mitral valve, tricuspid valve. We can close um, not just ASD, BSD, PDA. We can also close or RSOV. We can also close patent foramen ovale, and this has got importance in in strokes, uh, especially when you have strokes of unidentified origin. A simple echo or a T with a valsalva with contrast can demonstrate if there is a significant right to left shunt happening. We can also do left atrial appendage occlusion to prevent strokes in patients who got atrial fibrillation and, and are unable 
to tolerate anticoagulation. We can do all the adult congenital therapies which we have, which we have mentioned. And if a surgeon uh, uh, has put a suture which has given way, leading to a paravalve leak, we can probably close it percutaneously. For hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, although there is a lot of excitement today in a new drug called Mavacamptum, which is the opposite of Omicamptum, which has now come, which is showing very good results uh, uh, in you know, beyond beta blockade and disopyramide and, and amiodarone. Uh, we, we can also do a percutaneous in selected patients. We can do a, a what is a, a called a TASH procedure or a percutaneous a septal myocardial ablation procedure in, in by, by giving a little bit of alcohol in, in uh, using uh, a distally in the first septal artery and creating an MI. So this is the first case which was done. Uh, it was a transfemoral case, but we learned a few lessons. The annulus is not circular. 2D measurements are not adequate. We need a CT more than anything else. And we use area or perimeter, which is more valid. Uh, there could be some complications. So a lot of device iterations have come, which have reduced important complication. We today have uh, the Sentinel device, which is available in India, which can, which can actually protect the brain circulation. So we can decrease the strokes. Uh, well, we are learning how to size the device much better to, to uh, ensure that we do not have coronary occlusion. Uh, um, we, we size by CT the, the vascular uh, uh, access, so we can use alternate vascular access, and we can treat paravascular or, or vascular, uh, uh, leaks, So now, which have actually decreased as the devices have iterated. Uh, there have been a lot of drive, uh, drive innovation, so uh, we have to, uh, there's an importance of heart team and importance of understanding 3D anatomy, and, and it has helped evolved a lot of new clinical trials in both balloon expandable, even in low risk, self expandable, even in low risk. And there is significant evidence that tower leads to less stroke, lower mortality, less atrial fibrillation, quicker recovery, better hemodynamics, no scar. And, and therefore, there are some questions, of course. 40% uh, of Indian severe aortic stenosis is with bicuspid valve. And so, should you be doing? Uh, because bicuspid valves are not just a valvular disease, but also proximal aortopathy. But we have got reasonably good results. CAD, durability, role of embolic protection. What if this valve fails? Do you need to explant it or you can do a valve and valve? Which tower device to use? So bicuspid valves have larger asymmetric annulus, which leads to paravalvular leak, a heavily calcified refe, uh, which leads to sometimes an annular rupture, non-circular deployment, uh, so which can again lead to issues regarding uh, durability and concomitant pathology for the proximal uh, aorta, which can lead to uh, incomplete treatment. So commissional alignment has been a way to go. It not only is facilitates coronary access, but improves valve hemodynamics and facilitates valve in valve. We, we did notice, uh, Raj Bakra noticed uh, some leaflet thrombosis from five to 30%, uh, does not majority uh, have any clinical sequelae, it is dynamic, risk factors are not clearly understood, and uh, routine anticoagulation is still a matter of subjudice. So we, we know that we can, we can actually do a sour followed by a tower, but and we can do a repeat tower because if these patients are going to live longer, we can also do a tower. Hey, what if we have done a tower? What do we do then? We can do a, a valve in valve. Uh, so we this helps us choose our treatments. So the goal has to be to minimize open heart procedures and avoid performing them. So embolic protection, this is what the sentinel device looks like. And valve and valve tower, yes, sometimes we have to create place in the LVOT. We have to, we have to look at patient prosthesis mismatch. Sometimes we have to see whether, whether uh, the coronary access is going to be easy. So uh, um, this is something which is, which is a matter which is growing with experience. Uh, we are going to be better in this. Which valve to use? Today, we have many options. We have at least three indigenous options which are available. Uh, MyVal has actually been uh, a game changer the world over. We, we also have the Hydra and the PNF valve, which is now available. Uh, so we each device interacts with the aortic valve complex differently. There are some issues for, for each valve, and no one valve addresses all issues. For example, the Yena valve has just been used for severe area. The next evolution is going to be mitral and tricuspid. And really, we did not have too many surgical options uh, other than leaflet resection, annuloplasty, caudal repair, 
or actually maybe a, a, a replacement. But it was Ottavio Alfieri who, after performing an AVR, came out and his patient was noted to have severe MR. And he knew if he went back and, and repaired or, or replaced that mitral valve, the patient would not make it. So he just stitched the tips. And the same thing has been used. The Alfieri stitch has been used by developing what is called the mitral clip. But we have from edge to edge repair, coronary sinus annuloplasty, direct annuloplasty, mitral valve replacement, uh, artificial cords, neocords, and variety of other approaches. But what is popular today, although very expensive, is, is a mitra clip. It is, you go transeptal and, and you actually uh, hold the, the, the leaflets in creating or trying to replicate the Otavio Alfieri stitch. And there, there would be some challenges with leaflet pathology, small valve area, broad jets, uh, and there could be some issues. So um, uh, there are other um, uh, treatments like the cardio band, the millipede, uh, which are, which are, this is all transcatheter anuloplasty. It is more technical, uh, very challenging and still not available. Uh, first man have been done with transcatheter portal repair. So uh, they need to, these are all aspirational therapies because the ultimate aspiration is that you can have a pure transcatheter mitral valve. Uh, now the mitral valve is a more complex structure than the aortic valve. And it has, it's like a horse, uh, with a saddle and, and somebody on the horseback. So there, there will be some challenges. What about the tricuspid valve? It is a forgotten valve. And, and really, patients who have had surgical treatment for mitral and aortic valve sometimes come back to us with severe TR and they are really debilitated. They're edematous, they're ascitic, they, they are leading horrible lives. You can see their tricuspid regurgitation a mile away. But there are today a variety of different treatment options, annuloplasty, uh, orthotopic valve replacement, uh, edge to edge repair, and also heterotopic valve, which has been used in our country uh, called the trick valve, which is, which is something which can be done. Uh, this is of course the evoke tricuspid valve replacement system. And uh, there are some challenges regarding the annulus size and, and the future is uh, what we are using is as actually, what we are using in, the, in, the, in India currently is actually the trick valve, which is which actually places two stents, uh, covered stents in one in the. Uh, I will try and show you here, uh, which is which places a stent in the SVC and IVC and decreases the impact of the severe TM. So I think I have taken an hour, and I'm going to kind of stop here, uh, and we will start if Nilesh does permit us to 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 analyze going beyond this and to analyze the impact of COVID on the cardiovascular system and the post-COVID learnings, how it has changed telecardiology, how we have newer devices, how wearables impact us, how the wearables have impacted our day-to-day -day atrial fibrillation detection. I, I, I've had an 80-year-old aunt who sent me an ECG uh, uh, on an Apple watch, which detected paroxysmal complete heart block. So we, we have come a long way and how we are going to combine all this in using um, uh, future technologies using artificial intelligence, big data, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, even for our training, we will do it whenever Nilesh gives us an opportunity for part three. If there are any questions, I would uh, love to answer them. I conclude here. And once again, best wishes to Nilesh for having uh, done 25 issues of, of, uh, of Practo Connect. And best wishes to you all on the 75th anniversary of our independence. We, we all take an independence for granted. We don't value it because it's been there ever since we were born, but we must learn to respect our independence and strive so that we can do more for our nation. We can do more for our people and we can use these emerging technologies are not just high-end expensive technologies. We have to make sure that we can put the funnel down so that a larger number of our patients can benefit. Believe me, much of my practice is still clinical. So we, we, we should know about emerging technologies. We should know where we are headed, uh, but we should know what to do with our patient in, so that we have least investment, maximum gain. On this note, I'll, I'll actually stop sharing and, and hand the forum back to Nilesh. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. This is like a masterclass in cardiology. I've been attending for the past week and again, this week again. 
we do have a few questions over here and if others have any other questions you can ask us directly over here or you could email sir on dr anil dhal at gmail.com d r a n i l d h a l l at gmail.com you could ask him directly also we have few questions sir uh, before that i would like to mention one thing for the audience uh, like i was discussing with anil dhal sir before the webinar we are thinking of doing a series on how to read ecgs and how ecgs can help you diagnose diseases so if any of you are interested in uh, attending those ecg series please fill up the feedback form and tell us what you think about it about the idea and depending on the feedback we get we can plan a ecg series in the coming future uh so also another point we were discussing just before the webinar was my batch at afmc planning a get together at uh, kerala so the uh, push behind this whole thing is uh, surgeon captain vivek verma who is also a part of the audience today and he has a question for you all right vivek okay. is a very uh, I, i love his paintings okay uh, so you do know vivek so vivek has a question for you sir uh i'll read it verbatim which he says is it proven that blood cholesterol levels do or do not relate with the risk of coronary atherosclerosis the reason is asking is because a certain clan of people in japanese village live beyond 80s with an average blood blood cholesterol level of over 400 so is there an actual correlation always or are there other factors also involved for well, excellent question um we had all win the nobel prize if we answered all of them in a simple transactional binary fashion so this is more complex so just like you mentioned the japanese village uh, i will take you down to a village outside of milan uh, which is called limonesul garda there are also people who live beyond 100 years and uh, what was noticed was that although their hdl was only about um, 20 the hdl was very powerful so over the few last few years we have become rather than talking about hdl numbers or hdl mass we are now talking about hdl function because that was the period which got us in, involved in nicotinic acid research and then ctp inhibition came so why i am mentioning ctp inhibition is because uh, there is a new drug so i don't know i could not cover everything but uh, all the things were for lifting the hdl and it was thought that by doing ctp inhibition because we are all given to these yin and yang you know ram and ravan hypothesis in everything there has to be a good guy and not so good guy so 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 uh, the devil and god have to you know uh, scrap somewhere it isn't life is not so simple so what happened a ctp inhibition did uh, there were trials dalsetrapib but uh, um uh, um ivacetrape but there were off target effects and the off target effects were hypertension increased mortality but the effort in 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 many of those investments in large number of those trials actually went down but of late there is a new ctp inhibitor called orbisetrape which is again doing the rounds because in this village there is a ctp modification so the ldl is unimportant but in these patients the hdl is super 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 efficient but the world has to talk about the rest of the population for the rest of the population the acc aha and the esc actually became ldl centric because for 99% it is still ldl which has been our goal now people ask what is the numbers now i am not a number guy because the oxford university uh, looked at the risk of a patient so if you have a smoker high family history uh, who's who's got modest ldl but elevated lipoprotein little a i get aggressive so again hdl we are not checking hdl functionality so if the orbisetrape data comes in maybe in a year to two we may start looking at looking at hdl functionality in a better way there is a guy called amit kera who is in texas who actually does a lot of work on hdl functionality we don't have a biomarker an easy biomarker see an ldlc is an easy biomarker that we can measure lipoprotein little a is an easy biomarker that we can measure unfortunately for hdl functionality we don't have a biomarker as yet but inflammation lipoprotein little a apocyte 3 uh, looking at all of this it is not as simple as only ldl you are right 
but it is not, LDL still remains valid for 95, 99% of the human race. So therefore, let's not ignore it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for handling the question for us. So for the audience, this was part two of the, uh, of the webinar series. The link for part one is there in the description of the video. And we are uh, going to do the part three on the 28th of August. People who have already registered for, for the first two webinars need not register again. Uh, others, we will be sending out a registration link very soon. So please do attend the third part also on the 28th of August. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, giving this time for us. And hope to see you again very soon towards the end of this month. Happy Independence Day. Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind.